Oh, I see a vehicle f pulled up. Maybe that's them. Hello? Okay, so put the glasses on. Okay. Now, now, can you tell Putting. them, we're just going to have the camera running, but we're going to have the lens cap on. Is that cool? Okay. Yeah, no. Hey, Diggs, we're going to have the camera running, but we're going to have the cap on, so there's no video. Shit. Yeah, just do it. Just keep it yeah. on. Just put the cap on. How are you guys doing? Um, Feel that heart rate increased? So you're coming in the back seat? Yeah, all right. All right. Okay, cool. You want the camera? Yeah. Cool. You're not feeling motion sickness? Oh, yeah, now I, I'm feeling sick. I'm feeling sick. <laughs> you know, we're just going to hold people's arms and, and kind of guide them inside. Yeah, 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 that's what I was saying, so I don't fall on my face here. I think it's grow up. The grower admitted that this wasn't the biggest of grow ups. In fact, it was probably on the small end of the scale in terms of size. But I really didn't care. There are just so many things to see. The lights, the tools, the power, the pots, and of course, the marijuana. What do you guys do for the smell? I notice there's like a big well, we got this carbon filter here or whatever, and it just yeah. kind of filters the air in there, and then it uh, goes underneath the house, and we have it so it goes into, like, a dog shed. It's like, I'm in the beginning stages, and I'm learning. Over here, there's also another room in there. So you have a total of, is it eight lights? Eight lights, yeah. They go on 12 hours. This one runs 12 hours in the daytime. This one comes on eight at night. Did you say like yeah. the majority of the guys you know are just growing to earn some extra money? Yeah, yeah. it's like they have, they have normal jobs and you know, they're normal nine to five type of guys. The grower told me he cropped out about every two months and every crop was worth about $20,000. That's $120,000 a year. Even though this was a small grow up, the numbers didn't seem small at all. If those kind of numbers are coming out of a setup of eight lights, what kind of numbers are coming out of the big ones? And where do you find them? Well, it would seem just about everywhere. Barges, semi-trucks. Whether it was for the mobility of it, or whether it was an attempt to disguise the smell of uh, burning marijuana, of growing marijuana, in any event, it's unusual uh, for that reason. Even in? Train cars? Yes, it seems as though even our beloved caboose cannot escape grow up fever. When we read that 20 train cars were buried underground to grow marijuana, busted or not, we had to see this. So we set out. But not before asking our sound man if we could use his SUV and coaxing him with a little free gas. Or we were going, we would need it. We're in the boondocks, way up here. You wouldn't want to go over that puppy. This is what they brought up diesel fuel to power the generators in. With how much they were growing and how much the generators needed, I mean, that's a full truckload there. And finally, after a few hours on the highway and climbing Ooh. up the side of a mountain, we get there. We had to go into four low just to get up here. You can see I'm dressed right. I'm in jeans and frickin' sneakers. Fuck. My feet are cold. <laughs> There's no neighbors. Like, look to the right. There's nobody there. Nobody here. Nobody there. I mean, I imagine they're probably laid this way. They've been obviously following you, like, where you're getting your diesel, where you're getting the tanks, where you buy 10 train carts, where you buy 150 lights. These are diesel pumps, and it... Looks like there's still diesel leaking in these things here. This is how you got down there. Just want to make sure it's okay to go down here. I feel like I'm going into a cave. All right, watch your feet there. Not as cold under here. About eight train carts down that way. 
I'm guessing. So I can't even see to the end, and then two deep. Each one is two deep. Down here, two deep. Down the next one, two deep. Three, four, there's numbers on the wall. And then what they did is they cut them to make doorways, and that's how you have your hallways going into each one. There are water reservoirs here. And you see one, two, three, you're like, okay, that's quite a bit. But then there's this one, and that one, and another one at the end. Look at these things. Like, no wonder the cops just left it. Moving this shit would be a pain in the ass. Yeah, these train carts. I see why they bought them. They got a deal. They're like all rusted in the bottom. We could start growing here tomorrow. There's still dirt and fertilizer ready to go. Oh, here, who wants a little leftover plant there? Look at this. Just look at all this wiring right here. You can see the cops that come severed everything. What are those chains for? Chains are where they were hanging the lights. The reason why they use the chains is because then they can adjust the height. You know what, actually, you want to get me to run all the way down to see how far away I am? So I'm going to go to the end here and just show you how deep this is. And this was all filled with plants. Whoa. I'm at the end. Now, I can hardly see over there. It's just like lights to me. This is how far away, like, to give you an idea just how big this is. God, it's a trek just to get back to where you guys are. And you're going to see a lot of repetition because here it goes again. Bang, all the way down. When it's said in the paper 20, it's probably, it's gotta be 10, 10 long and two deep each one, because then you get your 20 carts. Man, I wish we could have seen that while it was still rolling. That is crazy. You wouldn't know there's a law here. Check this out, Cannabis Day, an actual day dedicated to marijuana. And take note, this takes place on one of the busiest high traffic blocks of BC's largest city, Vancouver. Marijuana, it's everywhere. Consumed and sold in every imaginable way. Pipes, bongs, joints, baked goods. It was hard to imagine that nearly every person attending this event was breaking the law, and yet no one seemed to care. The police were there, but not to bust people. They held traffic for the band to play for Cannabis Day. Now they went back to their side of the street. Sure, no problem, brother. No problem. Complying with the 5-0. <laughs> One of the organizers told me that in all the years this event has taken place, there's never been a violent incident, except once, by a man who's believed to be under the influence of alcohol. We heard there was a jazz festival happening at the same time on the other side of the block. It wasn't doing quite as well. But well, there was one group doing all right. Right up there, as you can see, is still Cannabis Day going on. But right here, not even a block away, is a church retreat. And they're selling donuts. I was like, well, what do you guys think about the, the rally? And they're like, we need to pray for them. And I was like, well, you guys are selling food for them, right? And that's, I'm sure they've, they've sold record amounts today, I guess, too. So we'll see. We'll get an interview here shortly, hopefully. The interview never came. There was so much marijuana, it was unbelievable. <laughs> I think we almost all got contact highs just from being around the smoke. But I did get a donut. I did purchase some of these on the way out. Those church girls got me. A culture of marijuana has been established in BC. From paraphernalia to cafes, from seed selling to its very own political party, the BC Marijuana Party, even bakers. show baked and baking where we're gonna revolutionize the cooking show and we're gonna let you guys in on the action meet watermelon girl she's made a name for herself as BC's only drug dealing nudist comic pinup baker did I get all that in she was arrested for selling her cookies down on wreck beach a nude beach is this for real I'm like the Heidi Fleiss of weed. I tell everybody, like, lawyers, doctors, like, there's no proverbial, yo, gee, you know, like, yeah. none of those, like, all, all professionals come in through my house, you know? A lot of people with money, 
a lot of people in politics. You don't want to know who comes through here, you know? My mother was a baker, and her mother was a baker, and we just along, we just bake. So I made these pot cookies, and I started selling them. It's hard to ignore such a, a large demand. So if you got arrested one time on Rock Beach, right? Yeah, yeah, I've been arrested more than once. Allegedly trafficking ginger snap cookies. Allegedly trafficking ginger snap cookies. So I'm assuming not regular ginger snap cookies, right? The one with that right. snap crackle pot. But even the judge is like, uh huh. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like he's just, he's seen violent crime after violent crime, and then along comes the cookie girl. Cops are supposed to come and remove undesirables from communities, and I clearly was not an undesirable person in my community. Like, uh, somebody else needs cookies. Actually, I just got picked up by the National Speakers Bureau, so I, I actually go on speaking tour to universities and talk to kids about marijuana. Oh, really? Yes, yeah, like the most genius. I'm like, you want me to talk about marijuana? We're like, okay. And they pay me to do it. Lock up your kids. This is a heinous crime. <laughs> so at some point, one might ask oneself, how does an industry of this size function while remaining illegal? Where does the money flow? Who's profiting off of it? Is there really $7 billion floating around the province unaccounted for? Maybe people are feeling the effects and they don't even know it. Turns out there seems to be a system. Some have even given this system a name. Well, a lot of people here in town and stuff consider it a union, right? A union? Yeah, a union, and you know, it's like a different, uh, it's a different term for pretty much industry. It's this underground thing where there's so many different tradesmen and different people all working together. You have to work together with people that you trust because it's, it's illegal to do what people are doing here. So this is how the so-called union breaks down. And of course, there are many exceptions to this, but this is the typical setup. First, you have a home or landowner. He doesn't take on much responsibility. He is simply the legitimate owner of where the grow operation will take place. All he has to do is pick up a briefcase every three months and pay off his mortgage. His hands are clean because he can claim ignorance if the grow operation is busted. Oh, I'm sorry, officer. I didn't know they were growing marijuana there. Then you have his 50-50 partner, the contractor, who will provide the equipment and hire the grower or grow himself. The grower is known as the fall guy. Why the name? Because that's exactly what he is. If the operation is busted, he takes the fall. Once the crop is matured, clippers are then hired. They prep the weed for distribution by cutting away the excess leaves and stems. What a lot of people don't understand is a part of the marijuana plant that people smoke is the bud, which in essence is the plant's flower. It's not the leaves. Clippers are generally hired on an hourly wage starting around $20. Tax free, of course. Once the marijuana is ready, in steps the weed broker. He's not always required, but sometimes the partner with the equipment needs a broker to buy his product and then sell it for him. In the event that a broker is required, it usually means the weed is headed south to the United States. In that case, the broker will buy the pot for somewhere between 1,800 and 2,000 a pound. He'll then hire a border jumper, a risk taker, someone who has the balls and hopefully the wits to get the product over the border. Some of the most common ways? The border jumper's fee varies with each trip, but they're always well paid. Once a product has reached the broker's US connection, it will earn about $3,000 a pound. The farther south it goes, the more it makes. If it manages to make it all the way out east to areas like New York, the price is driven even higher, somewhere between $3,500 and $6,000 a pound. Stricter laws demand higher prices and in turn provide more profits. In Miami, seven to eight pounds of BC Bud will trade for one kilo of pure yayo, cocaine. That in turn makes its way back up to Canada, eh? and sells for anywhere from thirty to $35,000 a key. If the marijuana manages to stay in the province, it will usually sell for around $1,800 to $2,000 a pound, depending on how flooded the market is. This is just the tip of the iceberg. The union embodies a slew of businesses and services, generating profits both directly and indirectly for the province. Some know they are involved and others choose not to acknowledge the benefits they gain from it. Carpenters build tables, rooms, sheds, and anything else that's needed for a grow show. Brand new homes are being built expressly for the purpose of housing a marijuana grow operation. Electricians set up lights, wire the electrical components, divert power if necessary. Hardware stores provide construction materials to build rooms and grow operation structures. Hydroponic stores supply lights, nutrients, soil, and other equipment needed to grow. 
Seed sellers provide, well, seeds. Clone growers create clones from other marijuana plants to aid in quicker growth cycles. Real estate agencies market houses to growers, unknowingly, but they profit all the same. There are some realtors, though, who are directly involved in the union and will actually cater to growers' needs, finding houses in secluded areas with big basements and power that can be spliced and stolen. Mortgage brokers and lease brokers who help growers with poor credit get the houses they need to start up. Banks who have minimal security to prevent illegal money from being deposited. The way it works now is deposits over $3,000 are sometimes questioned but are left up to the teller to decide whether the deposit is suspicious. If they believe it is, they may put a note on the account. It isn't until a $10,000 deposit that a mandatory FCAC form is filled out and sent away. But it is possible for $9,999 deposits to go through with little question. Oh, you sold some motorbikes. Cool. Oh, you sold your boat. Neat. Thanks for the business. You get the point. Lawyers and law firms who provide counseling on how to make grow money legit. They help set up and incorporate LTD companies and holding companies to launder money. They also provide legal counsel to keep busted growers out of jail. The electric company who makes money off of enlarged electric bills due to excess lights. The only time they seem to get involved is when they think someone is stealing the power. Law enforcement receives budgets to fight the cultivation. They create special task forces like the Green Team to specifically target marijuana. Canadians spend three to five hundred million annually on law enforcement and the justice system to enforce marijuana laws. Police also receive the benefits of seizing growers and dealers' assets. And last, but definitely not least, everyday businesses. Bars, restaurants, clothing stores, boat dealerships, car dealerships. The money funneled indirectly through various everyday businesses. Growers and dealers like to spend money on everything. These growers, after they crop out, it's like they won the lottery. You can tell the ones who are selling it. The more they sell, the more bling bling they have on them. Do you think they just hold it themselves and tuck it away somewhere? No, they buy houses, they buy cars. They buy boats. They'll purchase restaurants. They'll purchase, you know, I mean, whatever they're into. Maybe that's why we got busted. We got too carried away. You can tell yourself you're not going to let it go to your head, but I said the same thing. But when the money comes in so easy, you get accustomed to that lifestyle, and before you know it, you become a steamer. You become a hot rod. And that's what it comes down to. Yes, organized crime moves a majority of the product once it's available on the market, but there aren't a lot of bikers out there watering plants. It's mom and pa operations, it's young guys who see opportunity. It's not easy f to make that type of money doing anything, especially if you've been going to school for, you know, the past four years and you see this random other guy, you know, watering plants in his basement coming out of it with an extreme amount of, of money. Interesting, you have your degree. Yeah. And then you're, you're in the... In yeah, the I, ma I made the yeah. choice to, to put that aside and start growing weed. I could be making 33 bucks an hour which is a great wage, but really, why would I want to do that when I have the knowledge to make in a whole year in two months? What have we learned so far? Well, one, the prohibition hasn't reduced the demand, and it certainly hasn't reduced the supply. Two, it's a steady source of revenue for organized crime, which in turn attracts young people because the money is so easy. And three, being an underground market actually creates crime and violence. And yet, the only one paying the costs for all of this are the taxpayers, people like you and me. Even further, this whole deal is over a drug that seems to pose no more of a threat than the substances we already regulate. At the very least, why isn't this up for debate? Dwight Eisenhower once spoke of a military-industrial complex. Have we built up a marijuana prohibition complex? The real war on marijuana didn't start until 1972. And President Nixon said, you know, it's all the Jews smoking pot. And I mean, he really said that. When Nixon got into this with his war on drugs, he had uh, things that he wanted to do. He had an agenda. A lot of the information that was kept and warehoused in the Library of Congress and also at major universities was actually recalled and destroyed. The Nixon report that came out through his administration was called the Schaefer Report. It was by a Republican governor, and when he studied it and gave an answer, you can pick this report up, pick up any page, open it, and if you actually have experience with cannabis, you'll realize they're telling the truth. 
And then when it came back saying that marijuana was essentially harmless, he totally ignored it, so we're going to launch a war on drugs anyways. He didn't even print as many copies that Congress and the House would have been able to see. 1970, beginning of the war on drugs, 76 New Jersey troopers became detectives. I was one of them. They designated one-third of us undercover. I happen to fall in that one-third. That's where I spent the next 14 years of my life. What we were targeted on was the pot smokers. There was a very good reason we were targeted on pot smokers. Most of them were protesting against the Vietnam War. Now, if you could arrest that whole group of people because they were smoking pot, you didn't have to have a Vietnam War protest, which Mr. Nixon thought was a pretty good idea. So when President Nixon declared the civil war that we're living in right now, the drug war, in 1972, it was really a war on marijuana. It really didn't kick in until the 80s when Reagan, you know, took over um, as presidency of the U.S. Ronald Reagan, he said, these young people, they get together, they read books, they smoke marijuana, and they talk. Like these three elements were a recipe for disaster. How do I feel about legalizing marijuana? Am I for it or against it? I am totally against legalizing marijuana. And make no mistake, in the U.S. government, the focus of their war on drugs is cannabis. Uh, the focus of their rhetoric is cannabis. It's certainly used as a, a poster child for all drugs. When you see an ad for drugs, it's always the marijuana leaf that goes up. It's almost like a religious jihad, more powerful than going for the gusto causes people to think. When people think, they question. They question things like, say, the war in Vietnam, or race separation of blacks and whites like they did in the 30s in the jazz clubs, or women's rights, or the Gulf War, or oil wars. It's real simple. You put your loafers on, you put your black socks on, you get in your car, you have your briefcase, you say hi to your neighbors, he mows his lawn just like you do, and things keep moving along in the same direction they always have been. That's why marijuana laws exist. There are, in my opinion, people in government, at all levels of government, who know that it's not a winnable war, and yet they continue to pursue it. Acceptance of drug use is simply not an option for this administration. Often, we go to debates, and it's a police officer debating us. OK, the police are supposed to enforce the laws. They should not be arguing for or against laws. That's not their job. Well, what is their job? Is it to enforce laws that exist on the books? or to determine the policy of the laws that are made. The way to justify the policy is to create a lot of fear and then spend a lot of money combating that. Quite frankly, if you took the using population of all the other illegal drugs combined and you eliminated cannabis from that equation, there wouldn't be a big enough drug problem in either this country or the United States to justify the massive expenditures uh, that go towards fighting the war. The amazing thing is a small amount of enforcement that is necessary. $400 million is spent annually in Canada arresting and prosecuting marijuana crimes. The total budget in Canada for all drugs is $500 million. That means four-fifths of the drug budget goes towards arresting and prosecuting marijuana users, leaving one-fifth for crack, heroin, coke, crystal meth, the date rape drug, whatever. The drug enforcement industry is big business. It's self-perpetuating. It relies on taxpayer dollars. And so it's an endless battle that the DEA doesn't win. They participate in. It's like doing a big budget movie, you know. You get $30 million to do a movie, and then the movie comes out and it doesn't make any money. But someone made $30 million. Every once in a while, they'll show a guy, you know, posing beside a big bunch of marijuana, you know, this is the, the DEA money at work. It would be like asking loggers about saving trees, you know what I mean? This is where their, their mainstay of their cash flow comes from. The campaign will continue uh, until every uh, available known uh, plot of marijuana has been eradicated. We've got to live with it, doing the best job we can. Even if it's a bad job, we're all carrying a pretty impossible load, Miss Gibson. There are many, many police officers, however, who believe that it ought to be legalized, regulated, and controlled. They see the hypocrisy between our existing laws relating to alcohol and marijuana in their day-to-day -day life, shift after shift after shift, and they get it. 
but they don't want to lose their jobs. They don't want to lose that promotion to sergeant or the assignment to detectives. They want to be a chief someday, and they don't want to piss off the people in power. Judges, lawyers, prosecutors, defense lawyers, uh, prison guards, uh, there's all of those people in the criminal justice industry. Are their interests being protected? Well, in a sense, yes, they are. Defense bar, similarly, we make money. The more things they prohibit, the more money we make. Sorry I'm late, Kent. I was delayed in court. You still have large numbers of people being busted for simple possession. If you look at the stats, in terms of drug offenses, the largest group are still simple possession of marijuana. Every time you blow a marijuana cigarette, you take a chance on blowing your future. Oh, come on, Pop. All my friends smoke pot. They're not criminals. Only because they haven't been caught yet. If you do drugs, you will be caught. And when you're caught, you will be punished. 750,000 Americans every year are charged with pot possession. That's nearly a million people, and whether you go to jail or not, your, your life is in serious trouble. And that number of annual arrests for marijuana now rivals the number of arrests for murder, rape, robbery, and aggravated assault combined. You will never get over a conviction. A conviction will track you every day for the rest of your life. For instance, you remember that guy that used to smoke but didn't inhale? Former President Bill Clinton. This is not a big issue with me. I never even had a drink of whiskey till I was 22. Now, if Mr. Clinton handed me that marijuana cigarette when he was standing in a circle with us, it wouldn't have mattered whether he inhaled or not. He would have become a dope dealer, wouldn't he? Just like all those other people that went to jail. Never to be an attorney, much less the president of the United States. But the marijuana laws protect us. They make our lives safer. They send us the correct moral message. That's how 19 out of 21 nations have gone down the drain before us. Internal decay. The breakdown of moral, ethical, and religious principles. If you've been caught, a young person in the U.S., with so much as one marijuana cigarette, you can't get a loan or grant from the government to go to college. If you've been convicted of murdering somebody or raping someone, no problem. You go right down, they'll give you the loan. I guess the message is it's okay to rape and murder and pillage. Just don't smoke a joint afterwards. First thing that John Ashcroft did after 911, sent out a strike force to take down the LA Cannabis Buyers Co op. That really helped uh, national security a great deal. And what else helps national security? Taking down top criminal targets. In 2003, the US government put aside money to do just that 25 million for the head of Osama bin Laden. $15 million each for the whereabouts of Uday and Kusay Hussein, Saddam's sons, and a $12 million budget to go after one of the most dangerous men of all, this man. Can you tell us what exactly you were charged with? I was charged with conspiring to sell paraphernalia. Operation Pipe Dreams was, was a, a brainstorm of Attorney General John Ashcroft. The internet has been illegally utilized to sell these illegal products and to facilitate large illegal businesses operating in the open. A sting operation that busted people for selling paraphernalia to a particular county in Pennsylvania where they were willing to prosecute. Because there's two states, Pennsylvania, Iowa, void were prohibited. Well, it was prohibited to send it to Pennsylvania and Iowa. A man like yourself that is, you know, an established actor, comedian, you're not a criminal, like, why do you think they targeted you? Well, because our movies were number one rentals <laughs> in America. What our, what our movies did was really show the hypocrisy of the pot laws. In fact, when I went to jail, they had it in the transcript that our movies have influenced children for 30 years and will continue to do so forever. Therefore, I should go to jail. <laughs> You got to remember, they were going into Iraq, and they needed some diversion as far as headlines go. And they equated the billion dollar paraphernalia business with aiding terrorists. This was a legitimate company paying taxes. I was just the face on the bone. They charged me. I had nothing to do with the company. I never shipped anything to anybody. It wasn't even his company. He just loaned his name to it. 
51 people were arrested under Operation Pipe Dreams. Only one person, Tommy Chong, went to jail. But if I didn't plead, they threatened my son and my wife. Tommy stands up and volunteers to go to jail, says, yeah, OK, that's my paraphernalia. You leave my wife and kid alone. He's protecting his family. What kind of force was used on the day you were arrested? There is over 20 SWAT team people, visors, uh, automatic weapons, helicopters overhead. They had news trucks, Fox news trucks outside. They had the media on the ready. This is, it was a photo op for everybody. They asked, you know, do I have any uh, drugs? And I said, yeah, I got pot, you know, and they wanted to know where it was, so I told them. They said, well, it's not really a drug bust. I said, well, then what the are you doing in my house, you know? Then they said, it's about bongs. We're bringing down all the bong companies in America. And with Tommy safely behind bars for nine months, the United States drug war reset its sights, this time across borders. In downtown Vancouver, just outside the U.S. consulate, a bunch of people had gotten together and were having a rally for this guy named Mark Emery. He had evidently been selling seeds, marijuana seeds, to the wrong people. Let me tell you, the DEA wants me because I am very good at what I do. Well, obviously, I'm the most dangerous man alive. Like, really. Like, no wonder I'm facing life imprisonment without parole uh, for something that no one's ever gone to jail for here in Canada. No one's ever gone to jail for seeds, not even for a day. Mark and two of his employees are facing life in prison in the United States. Not Canada, the United States for selling marijuana seeds over the Internet. The Vancouver police came in here with a, a warrant for an extradition. But uh, we were taken then to North Fraser Correctional Center. Correctional Center of the year 2002. <laughs> Beautiful facility. Mark Emery has gotten in the face of the United States. The US sees Mark Emery uh, as a major political threat to its anti-cannabis agenda. In a press release from Karen Tandy, head of the DEA, she said that this is not only the end of uh, marijuana trafficking, but it's a blow to the marijuana legalization movement. I gave just under four million dollars away over 11 years to Supreme Court challenges, ballot initiatives, political parties, you know, drug addiction clinics. Well, if you're the DEA, who the hell do you think you're going to go after first and foremost and as viciously as you can do it? I think they even admitted it themselves when on the day of the raid, the DEA announced you know, said so he's a, a legalizer. We're shutting down the, one of the biggest legalizers. Uh, it won't, the legalization movement won't have a pot of money to draw from. Ha, 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 ha. Mark Emery has never gone to America and sold a seed. He does it all from here by mail order. And it's akin to Canadians ordering, you know, a machine gun from somewhere in America. It's against the law. And if we receive it here in Canada, they come and arrest us for receiving the machine gun. They don't go to America and say to Colt, hi, we're arresting you because you sent a machine gun to someone in Canada. No one's been sentenced to any time in jail in the history of Canada in 35 years. We've had this law. Two people, me and Ian Hunter and Victoria, were fined. There's all sorts of seed businesses still open. Mark's the only one out of about 50 uh, retail cannabis seed businesses in Canada that's been charged. Mark has been paying the Canadian federal government taxes on income he has made from selling seeds. The government relied on the existence of these internet seed sellers so that patients who had qualified for medical marijuana exemptions who were bugging them for seed were being directed to these internet seeds and Mark Emery specifically in some cases is the place to get their seed. It puts Canada and our government in a very difficult position because they've either got to hand over a Canadian citizen to a foreign government for activities that were entirely done in Canada for which our own government, our own police are not willing to charge him. If the Canadian authorities who rubber stamp this shit think that what I've done is so bad, then charge me. I should be tried by a jury of my peers. I'm not about to be tried by my peers at all. I'm about to be tried by foreigners. At 4.20, a time synonymous with smoking marijuana, everyone lit up. And for those who didn't have marijuana to light up, again, the police were close by, and again, they didn't seem to care. One officer had mentioned she was bothered by the smell of the smoke. It was kind of confusing. How could we be sending Mark Emery to prison for life in the United States 
if even our own police aren't finding it worth their while to bust people smoking it right in front of them. That's not the only thing that's confusing. The marijuana that's consumed in the United States, how much comes from Canada? I don't know much about Canada. I don't either. Maybe 20%? I'll go with 35. 35%? And a quarter. 50%. 50? 50%. I would say about 60%. 60%? 70%. Yeah, 70, 80%. At least 80% of it. Ooh. I don't think it's all that much. Most of it is here. We're getting the drugs are saying, oh, you know, BC bud. This was when some of the people in Canada were trying to get um, marijuana legalized. John Walters went up there and said, what you're talking about is passing a law that will allow you to export poison to my country. When we talk about poison, exporting poison, what do we export to Canada? Cigarettes. 430,000 people die in the United States every year from ingesting cigarettes. Five million around the world. So who's exporting the poison here? Of the six million people who could benefit from treatment and need it in the United States today, 60% are dependent on marijuana. Lies, lies, lies. You know, they invited me, I'm sorry. I wasn't sure who invited him and uh, why he came here yet again. He's been here before. He needs to shake his head. So how about him shutting down the cocaine that's coming across the board? How about him shutting down the guns? Sometimes you, you feel like you've stepped into Alice in, in Wonderland. You've gone through the looking glass. In fact, more Colombians die from U.S. tobacco than Americans die from Colombian coca products. So what's the drug war really about? Because if you don't want American tobacco in your country, America will go to war in a trade sense with your country. You have Canada engaged in cannabis policy reform and taxing and regulating cannabis, and all the scare stories haven't come true, uh, you have an awfully hard time sustaining your own domestic policies. What do you think would happen between Canada and the U.S. if Canada were to legalize marijuana? There's been rumors that, you know, they're like, well, shut down the border. I don't think so. Um, I've heard that too, but then my question is, would you want L.A., you know, in the dark and thirsty? If you do that, then we're not going to ship oil. We're not going to ship water. We're not going to ship electricity. It's not going to happen. We're too important to each other. The softwood lumber people going to stop doing business? Are the fishing guys going to stop doing business? Are the people who manufacture stuff back and forth across the border going to stop doing business because pot's legal here? Business interests aren't going to sit still for losing millions of dollars a day because of border wait times simply because Canada takes a different domestic social policy on cannabis. Yes, business interests. Sometimes they just seem to pop up and every so often in the most unlikely of places. We have seen an explosion in prison construction that lags only slightly behind the explosion in incarceration. There are more people in jail in America now than ever before. In the United States, it's one of the fastest growing industries. Some major investment companies at one time described private prisons as one of the best investments you could make. So you can make more money building prisons than any other type of investment. They're extraordinarily...